This afternoon is the Deputy Commander of, of U.S. Army Aviation Special Operations Command. Uh, Colonel Mike Morgan is here uh, representing uh, General Eric Peterson uh, to give a perspective on special operations and depot integration. And he has a, someone with him, CW5 Steve Blazy, uh, who I'm sure will provide some great sage advice on depot ops and special ops. Test, test, good. <clears throat> Steve and I are like the Rolling Stones up here, you know, going back on tour, and uh, we're joined. I'm Mike Morgan, I'm the Deputy Commander for U.S. Army Special Operations Aviation Command. Uh, this is uh, CW5 retired Steve Blazy. Uh, we're joined today by um, uh, CW5 John Brock. John, where are you? Raise your hand. And um, uh, CW5 Robin Vozar, Master Sergeant Eddie Alvaron. I, I introduced them so that you can get into some sage and uh, relevant conversations over the next two days over some things that we'd like to just have a conversation with you on. Uh, I'd first like to take the time to, uh, to thank Garner. Garner, thanks for hosting this. And more importantly, thanks for having the willpower to drive this through this year. Uh, this symposium is very important uh, to all of us. Uh, who are supporting a Army aviation, whether you're special ops aviation, conventional aviation. Sir, thanks for your leadership over the years and the other uh, distinguished gentlemen in the room, many of who have uh, uh, offered me personally a lot of mentorship. Not sure if I listened to it as well as I should have. Always took me two or three times to catch on, but uh, thank God they were patient with me. Uh, on behalf of, uh, Major, or, or behalf of Brigadier General Peterson, uh, Command Sergeant Major uh, Chambers, and CW5 uh, uh, England, uh, we are thankful for the relationship that we have been able to foster and build with the aviation enterprise and our industry partners. None of us can do this without having a team of teams, the team behind the teams. I thank all of you for being here because each of you represent many people on your teams that it takes to get this job done. Certainly over the last 14 years, uh, we have leveraged the, the power of collaboration, out-of-the-box thinking, and tenacity to really take it to uh, the forces that challenge the United States of America. So I am thankful. Uh, my living is generally made with, supp with supplying uh, aviation solutions uh, to ground force commanders. Uh, but I was taught a long time ago by uh, my first platoon sergeant uh, out at 29 Cab at Fort Ord, California, Staff Sergeant Harry Gilbert, uh, who said to me, he said, hey, uh, uh, if you're going to be in aviation as a profession, he said, everybody is a maintenance officer. He said, you better get that straight from the beginning and understand it. I, I have very little formal aviation maintenance training, but I've been surrounded by tremendous uh, non-commissioned officers, warrant officers, and some patient commissioned officers along the way who helped me bring that together. And that's kind of what this is all about today. Uh, Steve Blasey and I have known each other since 1996. It was Captain Morgan and CW3 Blazy uh, when I arrived at uh, a Little Bird Company in uh, 1st and 160th. And uh, I heard about him before even Sergeant First Class Scott Hildebrand dragged me over to his PC meeting. And uh, those PC meetings were legendary. Uh, and they were legendary because they harnessed the power of many. And it was really all about the skilled people with the right technologies and the right collaboration to bring it all together. And we would just like today to share some conversation with you, to share some ideas that we have had that have helped us, from our perspective, develop readiness, and more importantly, readiness as we move forward in a cost culture environment. It's going to take all of us. We've been talking about uh, the, 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 uh, the dangerous, complex, uh, budgetary constrained environment that still faces us. It's going to take all of these relationships and networks together. And I've spent some time in special ops aviation and some time in conventional aviation. And I personally want to thank each and every one of you and who you represent. Uh, because when it comes down to supplying an aviation solution for ground forces, uh, we're all in this thing together. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart and again from my boss and thanks for having us here. Uh, we'll start some things off today with a little tip of the spear type stuff, but most importantly, we wanna get to what, I, what we, we term, you know, the magic happens when the rotors are not turning. What goes on behind the curtain to make all of these things happen. Let's go ahead and roll that video if you don't mind. 
Let's grab that next slide. Hey, Steve, if you would, I want to, uh, this is the real expertise in the room. Again, these uh, five folks on this team have over 140 years of uh, aviation experience and over 100 years in, in SOA aviation experience. Uh, the other four are really the brain power behind it. So uh, Steve is joining me uh, uh, this afternoon to speak with you. And what we want to talk about is how we apply, let's see if this thing's going to work for me. Garner, we got some batteries in there. There we go, brother. There you go. Yeah, it is FMC, brother. Just like, just like everything you produce, thank God. We, we want to speak to you about how these tenants, we manage these tenants to get to cost-wise readiness. Had a boss, uh, Steve will share a little bit more about this. He used to just always, always bend us on. Always make sure the juice is worth the squeeze. That's all about what resources you have available to you, the risk that you're willing to take, and then applying those resources to get to a cost-wise readiness. Steve? Thanks. Thank you for the introduction, by yes, the way. Sir. Uh, and he had absolutely right. We've known each other for a long period of time. What he didn't tell you about that introduction in 1996 was when his platoon sergeants drug him to the PC meeting that after about 10 minutes, we had to kick him to wake him up. Because <laughs> as an operations kind of guy, he didn't uh, didn't understand the magic uh, the, of what maintenance is. So uh, he's come a long ways. He used some words prior to lunch that uh, that I was kind of surprised that he understood what they were, so it was, it was great. Uh, <laughs> All these eight-syllable words, operating I'm not used picture. to those. So, so anyway, yeah, Colonel Morgan talked about these tenants here. There's several more. These are the five we want to talk about today. Uh, we talk about our aviation sustainment strategy. Several years ago when General Pillsbury was the AMCOM commander, he was very big on the, the CBM initiative, moving RV aviation forward. What's the airplane telling us? Over the last several years, my, Steve Blazy's opinion, I think CBM has become misunderstood and it's become a three-letter acronym that a lot of people don't like to use. In fact, they don't understand what CBM is, in my opinion. So we took that up, bumped it up a level, and so we talk about our aviation sustainment strategy. The belief several years ago was you could take a black box and accelerometer, stick them on a helicopter, and, and you believe you can tell the airplane is telling you everything it needs to, to tell you to do maintenance. That's and that's not the case at all. It's a single piece of that environment. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Corrosion is, is kicking our tails. Uh, uh, Mr. Jensen talked about it, uh, cost of sto stocks and storage. That is a huge, uh, huge effort in our environment. Uh, we, we believe, based on data, that we lose somewhere between 20 and $30 million a year in corrosion losses due to storage issues. So we've invested in some technologies and some programs to reduce that number. That is a return on investment back to the operational commander, very important. Kermora also talked about the partnerships. Everything we do is about people. The hardware is the easy part. So we invest heavily in, uh, in, in liaison engineers, field service reps, logistics assistance reps. They are an absolute part of our team. We cannot do what we do without them. Then you take all the data that you're gathering off the airplanes and off your logistics systems, stainless systems, and you have to have some kind of presentation tool to give guys like this, the operational commanders, the power to make decisions very quickly based on that data. So I always talk about, the, you know, we're very good at modernizing our aircraft and our techniques, techniques and procedures. We are very poor at modernizing our uh, maintenance and logistics. And in fact, in our culture, in the, in the SOA community, the term, that's the way we've always done it, has been around for 35 years. And that's not how we're going to do it anymore. We have to get off of that. This is how we've always done it in environment. So uh, the, these digital visualization tools, bringing dashboards, bringing data decisions to commanders quickly so they can make those cost-wise readiness decisions sooner than later. General Patton once said, a, a good solution now is better than a perfect solution 10 minutes late. And that's absolutely true in our environment. We, we, we have to make good decisions as soon as we can to save as many dollars as possible. And then we're going to talk a little bit about our partnerships because, again, everybody in this organization, everybody in this room right here, every vendor, every government agency we work very closely with and have great relationships 
and it, we can't do what it, we do on the battlefield without those relationships. Hey, Steve, so, uh, you know, when, when, when you were teaching me along the way, and this will continue to be a mentoring session today as always, so if I've got the parts on the shelf, why the heck don't I just change them, you know, per the prescribed TBL? I mean, you know, the, the, the dog's going to run it out there, change the part, it's good, I've got it, the airplane's up, it's FMC, we minimize time, and we continue to fly the airplane. How do we do this? Check next slide. So great question, sure. So that's how we understand time-based maintenance. Fly something or inspect something, find a uh, defect on it, take it off, and put a new one on. That's a spend culture. Fix the problem. The, the soldier on the flight line wants to get home every night at a reasonable hour. How does he make his problem go away? Well, I have to buy a part, get it on the aircraft, and push it out the door. The Army feeds that model when it came out with its two-level maintenance concept several years ago, black box technology, take this one out, stick this one on, move on to your next task. So very expensive kind of business. So when you talk about cost, how do we keep air parts on aircraft longer? How do you re remediate faults that you find on components? We have uh, our technical manuals are great to about this far. So when you have a technical manual that says, Transmission, no corrosion allowed. Service member takes the transmission off the airplane, turns it in for a, uh, it gets another one at $700,000, sticks back in the airplane. Techno man, it doesn't say the next step. Go get a green pad, clean that, put some alodyne on it, repaint it, keep it on the aircraft. We get that technical expertise from our partners, but we, we have to carry that to the next level. So CBM for us started out back in 2007. We bought those black boxes. We put a bunch of accelerometers on our aircraft. And, uh, and we, we figured out right up front that we have to have a common solution across all our platforms. Can't have multiple vendors, multiple different uh, ground station software solutions feed, feed, feeding a common logistics environment. So we uh, kind of did a fly off, if you will, internally. We came up with a, a solution for all three platforms. And in this case, Honeywell provided solution feeds into our ground station. So, uh, on the uh, right hand side of this slide are some just things uh, that we realized very quickly up front. One I like to talk about the most is this, the second bullet there, we talk about 600 operational hours. A lot of people don't know that on a Chinook, uh, in a normal environment, somewhere between six to 10 hours of rotor track and balance time, flight time it takes to get in with using a, an Ava or a Chadwick or whatever solution you have on the field, to get it fine tuned to where the test pilots are comfortable with it. So that's a lot of flight time that are maintenance test pilots are sucking up doing their job that the operational commander could apply somewhere else. Within the first year, when we put these solutions on our aircraft, we realized really quickly that our rotor track and balance time went down significantly. It's generally two runs and release for, uh, back to the operational commander, so two to three hours of flight time. So you take the number of uh, rotor track and balance events and the number of aircraft you have, do the math, simple math, and we return 600 hours of flight time back to the operational commander. $7,000 of flight hours, what it costs us for parts and, and fuel, that's a huge return on investment. Second part of that, is, uh, Colonel Morgan was talking about, uh, we have on our unique aircraft, we have some Army common components that uh, have a different time life on them. We call them closed loop items. So we, we generally, uh, there's about 23 of them on a Chinook and they have about a 55% life equivalent to uh, a, a common Army aircraft. We picked five of those components that are what we call low hanging fruit. Generally always make their time before overhaul. We did some work with our uh, um, CBM solutions through with uh, partnered with AED and Boeing and just this year alone you can see in those two charts we raised our TBOs from what they were to what they are now and gained that much life uh, so based on the known removals that we do averaged every year by keeping them on longer on the, on wing we're gonna see a million dollar return on investment the first year so that is a CBM solution a success story so I've got that one down on CBM now I've got that lesson so just returning dollars to the commander, extending parts, that, that also equates to uh, timely readiness and more synchronized readiness from our perspective. You know, something else that costs us a lot of money uh, over the years uh, in uh, Army aviation is uh, the corrosion of parts on aircraft and also in their storage areas as well. And there's some tremendous technologies that are out there. I remember the uh, bird baths of old and the fire hose washes uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, that get the airplane to where they need to be after environmental flights or uh, whatever the requisite timing uh, 
to, to take care of that corrosion as well as the inspections. Steve, how, are, how, how have we developed some of these four C's uh, and, and uh, able to do this a little bit, a bit better? Sure. General Hubmacher, when he was our commander uh, prior to General Peterson, was big on corrosion. He saw the effects of it for a long period of time. He uh, helped us get our mind right, for lack of a better way, pay a better attention to corrosion. I mentioned the $20 million losses in storage. There's a significantly higher amount of losses on aircraft on wing as well. Uh, we just recently ran through uh, a, a surge of Ford transmissions on Chinooks. We lost seven of them in a very short period of time because of corrosion. A uh, very costly in, environment. So over the last couple of years, we've been working with industry partners in, in AMCOM's Corrosion Preventive Office. We've gone down some uh, some paths to get get after this problem in, inside our fence. Corrosion is not one of those things that's fun to do. Crew chiefs hate it. I hated it. I mean, it's it's something you got to stay on top of. It, it's very easy to prove that you have a corrosion problem. It's very hard to prove that you've made corrosion go away. You don't have that problem anymore. Uh, it's kind of like watching grass grow. Um, so at the end of the day, there, these, these four C's we talk about up here, there's some others to it, but uh, we invested in some covers for the on the flight line and while we're deployed. If you can keep moisture out of your airplane or allow the moisture that's in the airplane to actually escape through a one-way material uh, and help reduce some of that, that's paid big dividends. We invested heavily in uh, time with the soldiers in classroom training and hands-on training, even at the executive levels. Our uh, senior leaders have gone through training and the AMCOM Corrosion Office has provided to understand what corrosion is and what the effects are on your, on your uh, airplanes and what that means to readiness. We also figured out that we have a lot of storage of materials outside. We had a distributed logistics network and, and, and uh, parts everywhere. Uh, we, we did a lean logistics study. We, we reduced our logistics footprint by about 40%, but we moved all our stocks inside into dry, cool, clean environment. So they're dehumidified, they're uh, environmentally controlled at about 72 degrees and 45% humidity all the time. So we've seen a significant reduction in the losses of corrosion. So here's our number one, when Mr. Jensen's in here, our number one loss in corrosion, and you mentioned in your slides, it's not the stocks that we have on hand that we paid attention to. Right. It's the stocks that we're receiving out of the depots, not depot, but out of the, the supply system that have showed up, have been in cans for years before they, we had a transmission come in the other day, tagged, yellow tagged in 2007. And we opened it up, the can, the lid itself was rusted completely through and the transmission was unusable. So that is a, one of our challenges today. So getting that stock, getting it dry, cool, clean, it's huge, I think uh, the last number uh, Chip might have been Mr. Crotty back there, I think told me this number, $6 billion in, in DOD losses relative to corrosion. That's huge. That's a lot of money. So we we can all invest in this one. You know, that's, what the, that's part of the message here. We can all invest in this. And then the last thing we can talk about, uh, Colonel Morgan is absolutely right, in terms of washing our airplanes. We have organizations that sit on each coast and there wasn't a wash facility there other than watching young Captain Morgan with a garden hose years ago spraying <laughs> off his little bird thinking he was doing what he's supposed to do and spraying it in the cockpit. That's not it, sir. Stop doing that. Uh, so anyway, uh, we're going to show you a little video here uh, of a tactical wrench system that we deployed at Savannah. Steve, describe how this works. This is, this is tremendous. It's working great for us. So the aircraft approaches based on the type of airplane you are, at the helicopter, you feed a microphone, it will set up the spray pattern and turn it on for you and shut it off. So if you're an Apache, the spray pattern for an Apache is different than the spray pattern for a Chinook. This is currently in use in Savannah. We've logged over a thousand aircraft washes in the last year. It's not just ours, it's all of uh, Hunter Army Airfield facilities. Yeah, we've got corrosion under control now, or at least we're, we're, we're getting better TTPs on it, investing in the benefit of those programs. You know, I remember those, uh, I remember the, once you guys would kick me awake, I remember those PC meetings and, you know, just the uh, conglomerate of folks who would come to that meeting and, and, and the Army replicates that. That's the most important uh, meeting in any 24-hour period for any aviation outfit it is the production control meeting. It sets the pace for everything else. So, you know, we, we would have maintenance supervisors in there, uh, uh, leaders, and subject matter experts, civilian subject matter experts. How have we learned to leverage those things a little bit better? Sure. Uh, I know the AMCOM Sergeant Major was here somewhere, Sergeant Major Odom. Uh, what I'm going to mention here, I'm not at all saying this is a negative thing or reflective on a soldier. Uh, this right here, 
Soldiers only get so much time in AIT. We, we believe that they come out as A&P mechanics, but they really don't. They, they come out at it with a limited skill set with the objective of learning more of those skills on the job training once they get to the flight line. So th that, that skill set kind of plateaus till they get out there. Well, in our environment, our technology on the flight line has grown rapidly, just like the Army's technology grows rapidly. Uh, the, the things we're putting on our airplanes today are very technically challenging. And it is not a skill set that's taught at the uh, AIT level. And it's very, very expensive. So we have to keep those kind of things on our aircraft for as long as they can. I talk about it being expensive. The belief that ONS costs are going to go down uh, when you have an acquisition price five times of what it was you replaced with the old technology, and the mean time between failures still remain pretty low, means your costs are going to go up unless you get that under control. So we fill that gap. Uh, between that technology and, and the skill set to keep that on the airplane longer with our field service reps, our liaison engineers, and LARs that are provided. Uh, we, we actually uh, have a LAR, our liaison engineer inside our fence, uh, provided by Mr. Reese, he's Kevin's here somewhere, does a great job for it. Him, his investment, or our investment in him, returns $8 million a year in cost avoidance on our airplanes. That's, that's pretty huge. Small investment in him, eight million dollar return. So what does that mean? I either fly less hours if I didn't have that guy or I'd go back to the boss and say give me more money because I, I, it's costing me more per flight hour. So soft truth that we always talk about, humans are more important in hardware, absolutely applies in the aviation maintenance as well. General Magnum, when he <laughs> loved the guy to death, he, he, he sat us all around the table one day and he, he looked at us all and he said, how much does it cost to fly an airplane? And nobody could answer that question. And the comptroller thought he was going to be smart. He stood up, sir, it costs you what the SEAC rate is. Well, that's just how much the parts cost and how much the fuel costs. That, those parts don't put themselves on helicopters. They don't do the reliability analysis. They don't do the supply storage and all the other things that have to happen to make helicopters fly. So again, it, the things that those guys bring, that small investment, uh, readiness, safety, NEOFs. I know the Army experiences a, no evidence of fault found on black boxes, a huge problem. We were at over 50%, some cases 70% on black boxes. The challenge with that is a soldier will take the box off, stick another one in. That box makes its way through the supply system. The box he's stuck in, he still has the same fault on his airplane. He doesn't go back and get that original box and put it back in the airplane. That one goes through the supply system. So one of the examples, we uh, the, the EGI provided by Honeywell, no evidence of fault found. Just for us to take it off, send it to the OEMs, $9,800, mm -hmm. just for them to turn around and hand it back to us. That's a huge cost. We can't afford to do business like that. So field service reps give us the, tech, the, the technical expertise, the liaison engineers and others to make sure that the guy's troubleshooting it right on the flight line the first time and, and maybe look somewhere else. No, that box is good. Let's, let's look downstream a little bit and see if there's something else providing that, that, that problem. And of course, over the shoulder training is invaluable. So. Hey, um, you know, Steve, we're, we're talking about a lot of these tenants, but you know, how do we bring the magic together to make it happen? so that decision makers can visualize, describe, and ultimately decide. And, and then turn those investments back into things like more accurate flying hour models, of which we challenge ourselves to beat SEAC rates. What kind of tools are we using today? Uh, share some of these, if you would. Yes, sir. I mentioned about modernization, maintenance, and logistics. The same as systems that are out there that are provided to the operational commanders, OLSE and the others that are in the field. Are, are tools that a soldier can input data, but there's a lot of data that comes off aircraft. There's a lot of data that comes out of logistics. There's a lot of things out there. Nobody threads those data sources together to actually tell a commander what this means. And so we uh, we, we took some time and developed some dashboard technologies for that sp uh, specific reason to get after proactive material management, how we forecast for flying hours and dollars, and, and you know all the readiness stuff, even what Mr. Jensen talked about. So we have. This example down here is our commander's leadership dashboard at any given time to include on his BlackBerry. He can look at and if he, he wants to know what the regiment's doing, what our SOAC's doing relative to where he's flying FMC, how many hours he's uh, where he's at on his flying hour program, where his people are deployed and whatnot, where he's flying his hours and his readiness, not only current, but predicted based on his maintenance profile. So very powerful tools at the commander. And we have several below that for maintenance planning parts locators that goes enterprise-wide looking for parts, tells us where they're at. So 
a lot of times the stainless system looks into your own box, your own your own formation, says I need this part not there. Doesn't have the ability to look left and right at your brothers and sisters and the other battalions and the parts sitting right there. And you know, while I'm getting this one repaired in the back shop, let me borrow that one so I don't go out and buy another one. So we look left and right and up and down in our supply chain uh, to do that kind of stuff. The other thing we do on the other side is we take all those drivers based on three things, mission, maintenance, and money. What are our drivers that cause missions to abort or fail for whatever reason? What are the things that kill us maintenance-wise, burden? And what are the things, money? What are the high cost drivers for money? So we apply the right resources at the right time to the things that uh, make sense. So vertical hinge pin seals on Chinooks have been a maintenance challenge for since the day the Chinook was made 50 some years ago and never changed. We got some solutions out there, very low dollar, high maintenance burden. So where does it fall in all this? Well, right now it's not in any of that because there's some solutions out there. This is current not too long ago uh, from different types of seals. I think Columbia Helicopter got uh, helped us uh, get after with the Army. So uh, several things. So we know gas turbine engines are always going to be on our top of our list because of the environments we fly in. Very expensive, number one cost driver, number one maintenance burden. Uh, so we got programs looking at engine barrier filters and, and uh, black gold, what we call black gold technology going on compressor blades where we average three to 500 hours time on wing with that, that engine. If we can double that life, well, that thing will probably, that engine will probably slide down here, further down here, instead of being at the top of our threat list. So. Since I'm a digital guy uh, or an analog guy living in a digital world, some of you older guys might be that guy too. You know, bringing together uh, uh, maintenance, uh, the logistics set, the supply piece, the resourcing, but then making it digestible so that we can achieve the outcome is really what these tools, honestly, are, are all about for us. And then we're able to, again, make the right decision, knowing the risk at the right time. Um, let's go to the next one. This is uh, it's probably one of my favorite ones right here. I especially like this one up in the upper left. I appreciate Garner letting me use this. We're going to show you some of their work here in a second, too. But uh, quite frankly, uh, as, as we spoke to in the beginning, the relationships, the collaboration, the power of collective problem solving, I mean, that's really, I mean, no one does it better than Army aviation. I mean, the Army is here to stay. All great empires have an Army, if you listen to General Perkins when he talks about AOC. And the enabler of Army aviation is absolutely critical to the ground force commander. But it is the team behind the teams that sets the condition for this tremendous asset. Steve, let's talk about that uh, Chinook and how uh, CCAD turned that force an incredible amount of time and produced an, a, a phenomenal product for us. Sure. That, that certainly is not all our partners up there in that slide, but- uh, We got lots of them. Since we're at CCAD, it's very appropriate. We had a, a, a Chinook aircraft 783, had a hard landing on Destiny at, at Fort Campbell, main rotor blade. Aft main rotor blade came through the cabin, and you'll see the, the damage in the video. Had a transmission failure at a 30-foot hover. Thank goodness they weren't in flight, right. be honest with you. But yeah, it they, tore it up, didn't it, it Steve? They did. It lucky to be alive. Uh, but our aircraft are in high demand, low availability in terms of how many people want our assets. So we got a hold of Colonel Pogue and said, uh, hey, boss, uh, we got a problem. We need to partner with you guys, and we need this airplane back in six months. Can you do it? And he, he accepted that challenge, and his team accepted that challenge. But why that partnership is important, because it wasn't just Colonel Pogue and CCAD. It was a, the, this combination of everybody in here, from RDEC, Boeing, our team, TAPO, SOFSA, uh, the, the PM's office, and several others that aren't listed on that slide. But that, that team took an 18-month repair, a normal 18-month repair, and did it in six months. And quite frankly, uh, that airplane is our number one highest op tempo since it's been released from the depot, been deployed. It's the airplane of choice when the, the pilots go out there, they look for that airplane. It came home with a new car smell. It's pretty impressive. And it's a 50 year old airplane. It was uh, 50 some year, 40 some years old, high time, 10,000 hour airframe. That's an A model, uh, wasn't it, Steve? Yeah, wasn't that, one, that was model. one of the original A models. We've still got A models, actually, you know, that are yeah. been turned so, into Gs. But we couldn't have done it. Certainly couldn't have done it without, the, without their support and all the other industry partners that made, made that happen. It's harnessing the power of the partnership. Let, let's show these guys a great rock and roll video that Garner put together. I begged him to let me pump this for these guys. Thanks, CCAD. Thanks, team.
fresh paint and that new car smell going in there, huh, brother? Yeah, there you go. Let's bring up. Let's hit the next one, John. Next slide. Is that what we have? Okay. Um, we're about at the end of our 30 minutes. We would love to open it up for questions or any, any conversation. More importantly, we'd like to uh, continue the conversation if you'd like to. Uh, and share, share your thoughts. Th share things that are working for you. Share some solutions that you might have uh, that we can continue to implement. Uh, but most importantly, uh, you know, really for, for, for Army Aviation, the entire aviation enterprise, uh, our industry partners, it, it's really all about the people. Uh, these technologies, these systems, these programs, these collaborative efforts in the hands of capable, trained folks, it produces readiness. And we think we can move forward with this in a, in a cost culture environment. Uh, thanks for all you do. We'll open for questions. Okay, questions. While we're, uh, oh, there we go. Good afternoon, Kimberly Cronkite with General Electric. You say that you lose Hi, 20 to $30 million a year of stuff that's sitting in assets and inventory. The TMs have things that you can do for preventative maintenance, <coughs> like checking cans, checking pressures. What are you doing to kind of subside the bleeding and to start implementing some of the things that are currently in place? Yes, ma'am. Great question. And, and you're absolutely right. Training. Uh, we actually produced a video, a training video for the guys that work in warehousing and storage of the AMCOM corrosion office now proliferated out through the Army. As I mentioned, that was one area that we had a huge issue with. Uh, we, just like any other Army force, have to be prepared to go kill bad guys. So we've got to maintain a stockage level. So we have reoccurring inspections that look at the pressurization. We look at the desiccant uh, and those kind of things as well. I'll tell you, here's a funny story. It, it, we have more parts than we have storage space, so a good supply guy says, hey, I, I got this I got this rotor out of an engine that I need to make space for. It comes in a big container like this, parts only about this big. He's thinking he's doing the right thing. He takes it out of that hermetically sealed container and box and puts it on a shelf that he's got space for, not realizing that he just exposed it to elements and created a larger problem at a higher cost. So you're absolutely correct. So now, again, as I mentioned, those numbers are going down. It's more the supply chain that we have the issue with when we receive it because of the length of time it's been in storage uh, at other locations. Hi, John Chadwick, J. Chadwick Company. I obviously get the vibration side of the CBM already. Absolutely. But since you mentioned corrosion and along the same lines as your question, uh, are you using uh, CAB, uh, corrosion sensors as part of the CBM, both on wing and in storage facilities with RFD technology to transmit the data or anything like that? We uh, have a couple test programs going to put uh, some RFID type transmitting devices within storage uh, deployment kits so we can monitor that. We also have a couple programs we're looking at. Uh, one of them is a electronic sensing system, and I apologize, I don't remember the exact words of the technology, where they can induce in the aircraft 
electronic signals through the skin and through the aircraft and based on what those signals at each end of the, the receiving and transmitting device say can pinpoint to almost an exact location where corrosion may be occurring. One of our largest maintenance drivers in Chinooks and Blackhawks is pulling up the floorboards to actually look for corrosion. And then 90% of the write-ups say check found okay. So we can figure out how to do that without that. So absolutely a great question and we are exploring it. But cost uh, squeeze for the juice. Operational guys, you know, when I say, hey boss, you gotta take off this capability because I need to have this. You know, we, we have that arm wrestling uh, issue going on uh, quite frequently. Great question, John. Thanks. One less Ranger, you know, a little bit less fuel, maybe some <laughs> less bullets. So that's, a, that's always something we're, we're very aware of. Hey, Steve, on that uh, tactical portable wash down aircraft, is that uh, also capable of NBC uh, decon? Or what is anybody looking at that, or is it? I, 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 don't, I don't know for sure. That's a great question. Great. Uh, that's I great get question an answer. I know that uh, we yeah. have, there's going to be one put in at Fort Lewis. Um, General Hotmacher, before he left Korea, got one approved, I think funded partially by General Richardson. That one's in route over there as we speak to be set up, I think, next week. I don't know where there's another one going somewhere, but uh, I don't know about, the, they are deployable though. It looked, uh, it takes uh, three semi trucks because that's a, that's a iron pad with pipes through it, but it is fully deployable. It can be picked up in less than a week and moved to a tactical location. I want to look at the NBC yeah. aspect of that that's too. That's a great question. Yep. Anything else? Anything else? It looks like bad. Going yeah. once, going twice. Ah, perfect. The system feed in the dashboard is that is that your semblance your your portion of your all A is feeding that or is that coming from multiple data sources such yeah, as your that. CBM your all A information is what's feeding your dashboard? Good question and yes to all that. Yeah, so yes, we, all of them. We feed SUMS data, HUMS data, uh, Stanfin's data, GCSSA data, OLS data, um, but any data source that's out there that we have with inside our fence. First, we got to cleanse it, and then we have to figure out where the threads of that data tie to the rest of the programmatics. Data in for no value is, you know, this this data. So uh, we we built within our uh, within our environment this database called our common landing area. It's uh, you want flight hours. General Sinclair has a spreadsheet on his desk that has one number. General Adams has another number on his desk because he has their they have their favorite spreadsheets that they always use. Well, we found out internally that there's a lot of data sources that give you flight hours and they never match because of the latency of the data moving through the systems. And so I generated a report for Colonel Morgan. And he said, well, so-and-so just told me this number. So what we did is we I'm took all those data sources. on that is what I usually say, right? <laughs> yeah. So we took them all and we park them in one and validate what's the master source of data. And then we generate all our dashboards from that, that central data repository. Anything else? Well, Mike and Steve, thanks. Yes, sir. I greatly appreciate it. It was good, very insightful, yes, and sir. we greatly appreciate it, all you do. Um, let's take about uh, till 1440, if you come back in, and then we got a uh, panel that starts right there at 1440. All right, Army Strong, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah.